untamed beauty. That's what first drew me to the Canadian Arctic. On my first journey, our family left the comfort of home for two and a half months to experience the wonders of the North. Oh, I'm Okay. Cindy, goodbye, and you take care, and uh, we'll meet again. During that expedition and two others, I found more inspiration than I could ever hope for. And had the privilege to paint some of the most sublime landscapes on Earth. Exploring the wild. <laughs> Encountered magnificent wildlife. And traveled 40,000 kilometers in an effort to portray the North on canvas. A decade has passed, and I'm now preparing for a touring exhibition that will premiere in Washington, D.C a chance to bring the majesty of the North to the world. But first, I must return to paint places I've missed, like Banks Island, Hudson Bay, Frobisher Bay, and the fabled Northwest Passage. I'm heading back into an Arctic that is rapidly changing, where shrinking sea ice is allowing the world access to its resources as never before. And where remoteness can no longer protect this land and its people from the coming impacts. Can a simple wooden stick with some bristle paint the North into minds and hearts of others far away? Well, that's us in a couple of minutes. If we get in, we are going to be the only four people to visit Olivet National Park on Banks Island this entire year. There are some park staff there, but it just makes you realize what a privilege it is to get up to some of these places. After a year of planning, I'm heading to the Arctic for nine weeks. The scale of the north begins to sink in as we approach Banks Island. Olivik means place where people travel. And for two weeks, we will paddle the most northern canoe route in North America, the Thompson River. Flowing north for 160 kilometers, this remote waterway has rarely been painted. For this canoeing leg of the expedition, I'm joined by my brother Carl and our longtime friend, Anthony. After an hour, we're in Saks Harbor, the only community on Banks Island. Population, 112. A quick refueling, and we're back in the air again, now floating over a treeless Arctic tundra. Two more hours, and we cross into the park's 12,000 square kilometers of Arctic lowlands. The Thompson River comes into full view, a ribbon of life in a vast land. With everything we need for two weeks of Arctic river travel, we sit up near an old research building called Green Cabin. There's no turning back. Ah, it sure feels good to be back out in the fresh Arctic air. 
immersed in this transcendent land of 24-hour sunlight, a familiar transformation begins. A letting go that gives way to living in the moment, raising my awareness of the world around me. Beauty of being in the north, you're in a raw, wild place, and uh, you gotta be ready for it. No network. <laughs> I first dreamed of paddling these waters nine years ago. I can't believe I'm finally here. Each stroke feels liberating as they take me further away from civilization and reconnect me to the land. It's the beginning of July, and summer has just begun. Wildflowers have emerged to briefly adorn the tundra. In this Arctic oasis, we pitch camp and discover that we're not alone. Muskox. Three quarters of the world's population live on the island. But since the 1990s, their numbers have declined from 70,000 to just 14,000. A warming Arctic is accelerating the spread of parasites and disease. It's also bringing more rain that forms layers of ice and makes food hard to reach. Built for extreme cold, these magnificent creatures have a challenge ahead. So it's our second day on the water. You know, I could paint a lot of places along the way, but if we stop, uh, that could jeopardize us actually making it down the river. So we're gonna push a little further, make sure we cover the ground we need to. Who knows, maybe we'll be pushing on right past midnight. A small cliff has attracted some peregrine falcons. Where the rock face offers a safe place to nest. As a kid, I always had a fascination with birds of prey. One of my first big paintings where I started focusing on landscapes was actually that of a red-tailed hawk. I loved their power and grace. I couldn't have one as a pet when I was 10 years old, so I started to draw them instead. From my teens to my late 20s, my art continued to reflect my love of nature through painting wildlife. Then one morning, in an effort to bring more life into my art, I took my easel outside to paint plein air. Sitting by a local stream, I absorbed the sounds, the light, and the atmosphere. There were no animals that day, but it didn't matter. I was immersed in the magic of nature. From then on, I started chasing that experience over and over again. From the east of Canada, to the west, in my backyard, and in the wilds of Northern Ontario. Each time I laid brush to canvas, it felt like opening a door and letting it all in. The fusing of painting and exploring drove me further, seeking places of wild solitude to feed my body and spirit. It was only a matter of time before it would bring me here, past the tree line, to the far north. <laughs> the rain returns as we set up camp. Coffee's in morning, hot chocolate. Hot chocolate. And Carl and Anthony prepare a well-earned dinner. Little did we know the whole time, 
we were being watched. With winds too strong for canoeing, we change plans, step away from the river, and take in our surroundings. Being windbound can be a blessing in disguise. It forces me to put down my paddle and take time to explore more slowly. The kind of time I need to soak in this land and find a vantage point for my first oil painting of the trip. We got a nice ridge coming up here. And ridges, ridges usually mean a nice view. painting of the summer. Anthony and Carl have fished together for 30 years, but never for Arctic char. You got a tributary dumping water on the inside towards us. You got a seam. It looks very promising. A week into our journey, and we've become one with the rhythm of setting and breaking camp. The flow brings us to the Muskox River, allowing us access to Head Hill. Across this high ground lies 500 muskox skulls, 29 food caches, and 17 tent rings. A network of sites from early hunters who harvested them for sustenance. In this land that preserves time, they lay in full view. A fascinating story for a new canvas. The clouds in the background are getting really dark and they're casting a shadow over the valley. It kind of adds to the ominous feeling with all the, the muskox skulls lined along the ridges here. And it's actually helping them to visually stand out against the background. Oh, man. Mosquitoes are, oh, they're swarming as soon as you get out of the breeze. But this is not something that they taught me in art school.
as one day flows into another, I wonder about my understanding of time. What does it mean to the muskox and the other wildlife that live here? They have been coming and going for millennia. Without the construct of a 24-hour clock, moving to the daily rhythms of nature. It's like stepping back in time. The pre-Dorset people, the Copper Inuit, and even the Inuit of just a generation ago did not carry the high-tech gear we have. Though we have it much easier, the challenges of exploring this land deepens my appreciation for those who have and continue to call this home. I reach for my sketchbook a few more times, etching moments of life in graphite. It's an interesting contrast. You have the death of the muskox, but then you have this area of lush green growing up around it from the nutrients. In this whole region, this is the greenest little spot of life. <laughs> We approach our final camp and put the canoes to rest. We'll be exploring on foot for our last two days on the Thompson. What a peaceful evening. It's about two o'clock in the morning. Everybody's gone to sleep. Sometimes I just have to put the paints down. Just try to soak these places in. And if I don't, then how can my paintings and my art really have much meaning to them if I haven't felt the landscape personally? across the river to check us out. We get ready for our last hike on the island, but not for long. Across the river are now three Arctic wolves and 20 muskox behind them. And it seems that our young wolf has heard the call and rejoined the pack. With the wolves now sleeping on the beach, we head for the hills. This will be my last chance to paint on Banks Island. I'm hoping for one more big view to see the end of the Thompson, where it flows out to sea and completes its journey. We've been hiking about four hours now, and we are approaching what we think is the summit of this corner of Olivet National Park. Oh, we are seeing right to the ocean. <laughs> rain on the horizon, I pull out my trusty tarp. Well, that might hold for a little while. Whoa. Uh, the rain actually hasn't started yet, so maybe I'll leave this for now and just start painting. Got some nice pinks in the sky there, reflecting into the river. Whoa, here comes the rain, like I feared. Let's try changing the angle this time. This may get me out of the rain. Of 
course, as soon as you set up a shelter here, mosquitoes say thank you and they come visit. <laughs> it's getting stronger. <laughs> Reach my limit. Time for some additional weapons in my arsenal here. Ugh. Just incredible. <laughs> All that wind and rain has just completely died. From one extreme to the other. <laughs> I guess that's part of what keeps me coming back for more. It's been exciting and exhilarating to paint out in the wild and have wilderness surround you. I think we're going to call it a night and get back to camp, but what an evening. After two weeks on Banks Island, it's time to part ways. Carl and Anthony are heading home. I couldn't have asked for better traveling companions. I leave Banks Island filled with inspiration and paintings of landscapes seldom seen. For three days, I cross Canada's north to Iqaluit, the capital of Nunavut on the south end of Baffin Island. Gateway to the Eastern Arctic. Painting here is key to adding greater scope to the exhibition. For thousands of years, the Inuit have camped in this region known as Place of Many Fish. With almost 8,000 people now, keeping alive the rich history of living off the land is a growing challenge. Behind Iqaluit, there's been for the first time in six years polar bears right in town. There's some still roaming around here. It's a little cooler here by the ocean. <laughs> Maybe it'll help me get an extra half an hour of painting time. I might pack it in and grab my hot coffee. <laughs> I'm checking out some of the backcountry behind Ekalwit. I love these great big rocks over here. When the sun's catching them. Now that I'm further south in the Arctic, the sun is setting once again. And I battle against time to capture the essence of the scene. day here, calm waters offer me the chance to see what lies past the edge of town. I'm back in the wild. Nice as far as yeah, I can see. I think it's a cool idea right here, looking at this chunk of ice that I know that a few hours ago I would have been underwater. I think I found something after all, a little different than what I thought I was going to paint. 
Sometimes, you know, you rush a little too much. And you miss out on a beautiful little spot like this. My time here has been brief, but eye-opening. I leave with three new paintings and just a small taste of Ecalibut. Our next stop is the community of Nauyat. From there, we'll travel by boat to Ukusikslik National Park, featuring rich archaeology, abundant wildlife, and a rare reversing tidal waterfall. From the air, however, I see a lot of ice. Until a recent name change, Nayat was known as Repulse Bay and is the only community in Nunavut to lie directly on the Arctic Circle. Many of the 1,000 residents are direct descendants of the Thule people, who lived here over 400 years ago, a testament to the enduring nature of the people that called this place home. I used my first evening to get a sense of my new surroundings. In the distance, on the ocean path to Ukusiksalik is a thick band of white, a wall of ice. I start to wonder, will the ice keep us from making it to the park? With our departure for Ukusiksalik now delayed, I explore nearby. For generations, whales have been critical to Arctic living. They provided food, building materials, heat, and light. Foreign whalers changed all that when their overfishing nearly drove the bowhead to extinction in the 1900s. Their presence also brought epidemics of tuberculosis, typhus, and scarlet fever. Only a few members of the Settlermiate people of Southampton Island survived. The commercial whale hunt was shut down in 1935. By 79, the Inuit were no longer allowed to hunt them either. Numbers started to recover in the 90s, and the traditional hunt was revived, allowing Arctic communities to harvest a small number annually. The bones of this majestic bowhead whale have stood for two years, a symbol of life in the north. Sometimes, little side road trips take you to some great views. This just happens to be one of those times. Oh yeah, this is looking nice. The sun over here is what's just begging to pop back out. So I'm thinking I want to paint something in this direction. Time to go look over here. No, definitely cutting off a little too much of the landscape here. It's trying to find that right balance of composition that just suits the eye, that turns it into painting, not just a view. So that can become darker in the foreground. Time to crack up the big brushes and try to this painting is moving faster. I'll be traveling to Ukusikslik with Parks Canada. And this morning, we get together for the latest news on the ice conditions. I meet David, an elder in the community with a lifetime of experience traveling these waters. He was born out there and has seen it all. So Park Superintendent Monty Yank has asked David to be the captain of this boat trip. Also joining us from Parks are Theron, a young man from the community, and Serge. 
Despite shifting plans, I'm grateful that of all places to wait out an ice delay, it's here, surrounded by beauty. Days pass with little signs of change in the ice, and I find a scene where the past and the present meet. A modern Inuit cabin set against the archaeological footprint of a structure from days gone by. And my wandering opens the door for me to paint my first Arctic community. I remember arriving nigh out a few days ago and saying what a beautiful community it was. Little did I think I'd actually end up painting it. The morning brings clear Arctic skies, calm waters, and a new plan. Okay, straighten her out. The park is still off limits due to ice. So instead, we're heading to early Arctic explorer John Ray Stone House from 1846. I may become the first artist ever to set up an easel and paint it. Born in 1813 in Orkney, Scotland, Ray was a surgeon, fur trader, and explorer. He discovered the final link of the Northwest Passage and was known to cover 1,500 kilometers in just over a month pulling heavy sledges in freezing blizzards. But unlike others of his era, Ray chose to learn from the Inuit. Adopting many of their ways, he went on to become one of the greatest Arctic explorers in history. We step ashore near the mouth of the North Pole River. Yeah. You must want to you want to try this? Much easier with your knees. Okay, great. He stops and teaches me some of the Inuit ways of living off the land. Those, those were used to fire. Nice smell. Mary and I used to put the teapot. It gets really warm. There's not too much chance of starting a forest fire up here. Uh, there, there used to be fires, even if there's no... You saw some fire, yeah? Wow. Yeah. Sometime, yeah. Well, right now, it's growing. OK. I can't help but feel a little of what John Ray might have felt when he arrived here over 170 years ago. Still good? Oh, well, good. Yeah, when the whalers came here, you think they knew about eating all this stuff? No, nope. I'm pretty sure they didn't. It was very mild. Yeah. So Theron picked up this mushroom off the ground. David just put it on a cut that he had. 
A rotting mushroom, I guess, is good to put on wounds. But no eat? No. <laughs> you want to eat, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> We crest a hill, and there, nestled in the shallow gully, is Ray's stone house. We have arrived at Fort Hope. This is where Ray and his crew became the first Europeans to spend an entire winter in the Arctic. He soon realized that while stones are a great construction material back in Scotland, they're not too suitable up here. He used it probably for the first winter, but then after that, because it got so cold, he then adopted the ways of Inuit. Started to sleep in an igloo in the subsequent winters. This is the doorstep. We had caribou skin here, three glass windows. Okay. It's a really interesting construction. The moss that's been used in between. Pretty hard to imagine actually living in here back in 1850 in the dead of winter when it's black and getting down to minus 40, minus 50. I heard about somewhere. What do you think? Oh. Did he have food in this, maybe? Yes. Put this. Make a fire. Put, put that. Make that. OK, so you fill that with seal oil. Yeah. And then you put the moss along the edge so it acts like a wick. You get a nice flame and heat coming up. Well, I'll put this back where I found it. It's down there. Very nice. Yeah. I'm trying to find something that shows off the walls and, and also shows the environment. It's one thing to be a, a visitor here, as I am, kind of figure your way about things. And when you travel with someone like David, who's He's been on the land all his life. And everything is just second nature. It's the oneness with the land that I know I'll never achieve, but it's part of the process of coming out here and getting a taste of it anyway. Uh, you don't mind me going here, David? With my painting gear packed up, David and Theron lead me to another river mouth. It's time for a lunch break. There's an area where there's a little waves. Yeah, something that comes up the shore uh, that shows us it's a good spot. We don't just put the net anywhere. And sure enough, in no time, experience is rewarded with one of the finest tasting meals in the Arctic. That didn't take long. Couldn't have been more than 20 minutes, and he's got two fish in the boat. Hey, there, can I see yours? <laughs> so here's the Arctic char, and here's the liver. The good part, you say? One of the best parts of the fish. As we leave this bountiful and historic corner of Hudson Bay, David decides that it's time to go check on the ice conditions to find out once and for all, will we be able to make it to the park? We're heading for the ice wall. For over 10 days now, we've not been able to get into the park because of ice. At first, the ice is sparse, and I'm hopeful. Nothing like the solid wall it appears to be from far away. But then it thickens. goes on for miles. The reality finally settles in. If a big wind comes up when you're in this tough, you could crush all the ice up against the boat. Getting to Ugasikslik National Park is not going to happen this summer. We head back to town. With the long planned trip to the park officially shelved, we hit the water for one last day of exploring before I move on from now yet. We're heading to another place of fascinating Arctic history the Harbor Islands. 
From 1860 to 1915, this region lured American and Scottish ships in search of the bowhead whale. Some wintered over, joined by Inuit who built snow villages on the ice. How far do you think it is? On your top. In the summer of 1892, Captain Alexander Murray sailed in with a ship called the Perseverance. On this hill, they left their mark behind. Looks like David has found some carvings here in the rock that are from the, the time of the whalers here. Some of the names of their ships Perseverance. Perseverance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Carving of a bowhead whale? Right here, yeah. These are the same whale bones I sketched on the side of Naya the first couple yeah. days I yeah. was here. I can read this one, though. 1892. 1892, wow. Yeah. This bowhead we got there. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. And but they're big. One we got up there, too. Close one. One per year? Yeah. For the community? Yeah. They taste good? Oh, yeah. Oh. Just incredible. Another piece of Arctic history. This makes traveling up here such a rich experience. With the rocky terrain, I scanned the ground. An old chunk of bowhead whalebone here from the whaling days. Wow. Very cool. A few steps later, I stop in my tracks. I've seen a lot of skulls on this trip so far, but they all belong to animals. This is the first human skull I've ever come across. It's kind of eerie and privileged at the same time. Over the rise, we find two very old graves. Two old whalers in the original home of the skull we just found. It was likely relocated by a polar bear decades ago. And there's some old writing left on here too, huh? Weathering more than 100 cycles of harsh Arctic winters and short summers, this casket has fared well. But the weight of the rocks and time itself have opened cracks at the seams. Though a little eerie, the whole scene has a beauty of its own. As I breathe in the fresh Arctic air, it's all quite peaceful. Looking at these graves, I'm reminded to make the most of each moment. My time in Nauyat winds down. I never did make it to the park, but other experiences filled the void and brought new paintings to my collection that I would have never dreamed of. Five and a half weeks into my expedition, and I find myself once again heading north. Back in the air over Baffin Island, the dramatic landscapes fill my view until I reach the community of Arctic Bay. This mountain-lined hamlet is home to 850 people. And nearby, 
one of many reasons for stopping here. 600 foot high red cliffs rising from the ocean. With an array of stunning new views and only two days, I get moving. We're further north again, and so instead of the sun setting as it would about now, it's not gonna set or just barely set again tonight. I'm starting to lose track of time up here in the Arctic. This is big landscapes all around. And coming up to this little spot, we get some nice evening glow on the distant mountains. My heart races as I struggle to capture the sense I'm feeling. The timelessness of being enveloped by the splendor of the Arctic light. This is uh, just incredible. Oh, yeah. Okay, here's some fresh paddock that my wife just made. The first rule of painting, don't go on an empty stomach. Mm. Surrounded by water and soaking in the warmth of the Arctic sun, I'm in a painter's paradise. How about you do this up here in this corner right here? We'll grab from that color right here, color up, super. Now I can keep working on the bottom of the painting. Thanks. The sun slides over in the sky, casting the cliffs into shadow. It's my signal to move on. We leave the cliffs behind and begin making our way back to Arctic Bay. But Leo has other plans. He keeps the bow straight and aims for the end of Adam's Sound. For the rest of the day, I see new dramatic views. Though there's no time to set up my easel again, I reach for my sketchbook. midnight, the glow on the horizon fills the sky and plays with the ice. My time here has been visually intense, but far too brief. A short flight over Lancaster Sound brings me to Resolute Bay. From here, I'll head east by boat and encounter two fascinating figures from Canada's history. Artist A.Y. Jackson, who was a co-founder of the Group of Seven in 1920. He helped forge a distinct Canadian identity through his paintings of wild places. And Arctic explorer John Franklin, who in 1845 set out to find the Northwest Passage and never returned home. The present and the past mix in Canada's second most northern community, where I prepare to meet up with outfitter Randy Nungak and his son Sheldon.
We hit the open water and we luck out. It's clear sailing. But then a wall of ice appears in the distance. This is feeling a little too familiar. We make it through the worst of it, and I breathe a sigh of relief. Just around the bend is Cape Hotham. A.Y. Jackson was there with Frederick Banting, the discoverer of insulin on the Beothic. It was a supply ship taking care of communities and did his own sketches when he passed by. And to be this far north as an artist and to connect with some of my own artistic history here in Canada, it's just awesome. With Cape Hotham in view, I show Randy a copy of a 1930 A.Y. Jackson sketch that I brought with me. The one peak in his sketch lines up with what I'm seeing, but the second one is missing. But there's no doubt, this is the place. Luckily, a little iceberg is here to go along with the scene. As we circle it, the sun peeks out briefly. Oh, this is gorgeous. Right about here, if it's possible. That's, uh, love the way that... All right, that's, that's it there. His angle is around the corner a little bit more. The peak's really sharp there, and there might be another mountain. But also, he had little icy bits of bergs in here. I guess I got lucky, because I got a bigger bit for my sketch. Can we back up just a bit more, Randy, please? Yeah, right about here. Thanks, this is beautiful. What a treat to connect with the landscape first and foremost, but also to have a little connection with A.Y. Jackson being up here too. I think this little sketch is gonna turn into a painting back in the studio. And I'm feeling just a little off. <laughs> So oh, maybe it's time to move on. <laughs> Thank you very much, Randy. I think we may have found the view that A.Y. Jackson had back here. It's looking pretty much like in his sketch. Randy steers the boat into the rough waters of Wellington Channel. After an hour and a half, we make it to the other side. Beachy Island, a warehouse of incredible Arctic history. I brought another sketch along with me from A.Y. Jackson, and it seems like we may have a match here. The Mary at the foot of the cliffs. It's midnight now, and we pull ashore on nearby Devon Island. Gray skies give way to vivid hues. As I chase the light until 3 a.m. guys are back at the boat having breakfast and I had to get out here and come explore some possible views looking back at the island. Sketch. It's so full of history over there, but my first instinct is still to look at the landscape. The landscape is bigger than the human history. This land is here before and after, and we leave our mark on it, but we're just minuscule compared to it. cooking up a little dinner for lunchtime here aboard Randy's boat. So we thought we'd better fill our boat because last night we had incredible lighting. And uh, if that happens again tonight, we're not gonna be having dinner again. Sheldon apparently is gonna put a dent in this, so they're making a big load. <laughs> At last, we head out to visit the graves on Beachy Island. We cross Erebus and Terror Bay, named after John Franklin's two ships. They spent the winter of 1845 in the ice, 
with three years of provisions. The Graves have been here since, men from the crew of his ill-fated third and final journey in search of the Northwest Passage. The following summer, after ice breakup, they pushed on, never to be seen again. 129 men, including Franklin, perished. You all right to hang out there at the boat while I go try to paint? Sheldon stays with us to watch for polar bears, while Randy pulls out to wait in the bay. The graves before me stand as one of the most vivid examples of Arctic exploration history, a gripping reminder of the past. The setting sun transforms the landscape, and despite my fascination with history, I find myself caught up in the present and the beauty surrounding me. Further east, we arrive at the monolithic Caswell Tower in Bradstock Bay. My final destination with Randy and Sheldon. Devon is the largest uninhabited island on Earth, but that was not always the case. Behind our landing place are relics of an ancient Thule community from over a thousand years ago. strike out for a better look at the looming Caswell Tower. To start my last painting while out here on the land. But the toll of six and a half weeks of Arctic travel catches up with me. This view is just too striking and rare. That reminds me of, of the Devil's Tower and Close Encounter of the Third Kind. Everything is raw, wild, and there's no one around for many miles. Right on cue, my next ride appears on the horizon. will be traveling by ship for the last 17 days of my Arctic summer. Good to see you, man. Oh, thank you. Glad you guys made it, more importantly. <laughs> for, uh, it's been awesome. Great to get out with you. You too, man. A One Ocean Expeditions vessel is in mid-voyage with 80 guests, and they've made room for me. Each day we will go to shore, offering me new opportunities for my canvases in new places. And it will give my body a much needed break. As we lurch into the Northwest Passage, my exhaustion is replaced with exhilaration. 
like A. Y. Jackson before me, I too am now voyaging the north by sea. New regions of the Arctic open up to me as never before. That is that old Hudson Bay trading post sitting way on the point over there. More fascinating places of history. Abandoned, forlorn, and forgotten. One can almost hear voices of the past as you walk by. The rain, the fog, the cold conditions, it really seems to suit the scene nicely. The human history is so fascinating. Connecting with it. Thinking about what it was like to maybe live in this environment. This has just been great. Two days in a row, painting old Hudson Bay trading posts. Like on the Thompson River two months ago, the days begin to fuse together. Each one brings new and wondrous landscapes. Time loosens its grip on me, and I'm swept away. in Dundas Harbor, up on the southeast side of Devon Island. There's some icebergs over here that I need to check out. And maybe RCMP buildings over on the other side of the hills. breathe the pristine air. I see endless beauty. I feel alive with awe. And I wonder, what will we do to this Arctic world?
stepping ashore at the bottom of Gibbs Fjord, I set up my easel on Arctic soil for one last time this summer. Let's focus a little. There we go. This is, uh, this is it. This is my last morning of having really lived up here in the Arctic. And it's kind of a bit of a sense of finality, I guess, in some ways. Uh, I hope that the last 25 paintings or so that I'll have completed when it's all done will add that a final piece of the puzzle to this collection I've been developing for about a decade. And that when it's all brought back together in a couple of years as it begins to tour, uh, I really hope it has an opportunity to, to connect other people with this incredible wilderness, that they may feel some of the passion and some of the awe that, and, and the wonder that I've had while being up here. I first stepped foot into the Canadian Arctic over a decade ago, I never imagined that the journey would lead me here. Its timeless landscapes now seem so far away. But in some ways they're not. Impacts are being felt across the north from decisions made here and by governments around the globe. After four expeditions, 60,000 kilometers, millions of brushstrokes, and years of passion, I start to wonder, can these paintings draw people closer to the remote and fragile landscapes they portray? to welcome artist, filmmaker, intrepid explorer, and friend to the embassy, frankly, Corey Trepanier, who has traveled Canada's Arctic in an effort to create an unprecedented collection. If at any level at all, my art can reach out behind the strokes on the canvas and help others connect with our natural world, then I will consider it my greatest reward. Thank you. The exhibition opens. Anchoring the tour, it's the largest painting of my life. Seven years ago, I was overwhelmed by a visit to Coronation Fjord on Baffin Island. It was breathtaking. The encounter resulted in the 15 foot wide Great Glacier. My greatest effort to capture and convey the splendor of the North on canvas. As the exhibition travels from city to city, the response is overwhelming. I sense a passion about this land that so few ever see. It just makes me feel like I'm there. And I'm hopeful that maybe a simple paintbrush can make a mark on the hearts of others. It can help us think about what's going on. It's not just art, but also it's a documentation of, of what we have now and what we can lose. I first went north over a decade ago seeking beauty. I 
found it in so many ways. In the minute. And in the vast. In majestic wildlife. And in the people who shared this land with me, for whom the Arctic is home. Oh, you are gonna love this. I got some fish for supper, but I love it. <laughs> All right, dude. Whoa! Getting yet and we still playing. God created them 100% for polar bears because I'm very scared. <laughs> we never quit. That's right. <laughs> that should be our trip to slogan. I walk back through time, experience the grandeur of the North with my family, who are now all grown up. In my eyes, I've been opened to a world undergoing great change as our quest for progress alters this land with alarming speed. By the time my daughters are my age, will these paintings become just a memory of an Arctic that once was? We need an Arctic awakening in our nation's leaders, in all of us. An embracing of the wonder of the North that inspires caring action. A path to real hope for the future. So now come sit down with you, talk with me now and let me see through your eyes where there is so much light. We are biding our time for these myths to unwind, for these changes we will confront. So please beware with every place that you head And look to your soul for these things that you know For the trees that we see cannot forever breathe With the changes they will confront You know some people they just won't understand Message, but I don't understand. No, I just won't understand. He said, In this sacred land, it has seen many hands, it has wealth and gold, yet it is fragile and old. Loud of the things you are proud of. If you love this coast, then keep it clean as it holds. Cause the way that it shines may just dwindle with time. With the changes it will confirm. So you know, some people that just won't understand, or just won't understand these things. Thank you for your message, but I don't understand. Someone's day, well, I know you a 
strong May your journey be long And now I wish you the best of luck You know some people They just won't understand No, they just won't understand these things Thank you for your message But I don't understand No, they just won't understand these things